nothing they could do about it anymore. For those waters had come to clear away the violence. And so all those people were in the ark. Now just rock back this way and this way and this way. And you can imagine what it was like for an entire year. <laughs> And the waters came down as it takes this, the earth to go around the sun. And the, they wondered whether they would ever see land again. And they began singing a song of healing. And the song went like this. El na rafanala. Want to try that? El na rafanala. And it means great spirit, heal her. El na rafanala. silent outside and they opened the windows of the ark and the rain had stopped and some of the birds volunteered to go see if there was any land and they flew out and they went looking and it seemed hopeless because all the earth was covered with water and then some more birds went out and they began flying and flying and imagine yourself flying like a bird over the water of the flood asking for life oh let there be life don't not wash life away and the people sang and a great tree came out of the waters and its branches stretched to all corners of the earth and it was a tree of knowledge the tree of life and the birds took and they brought it back to the ark and lo and behold there was life and after that the waters went down and the ark came and settled on top of mount ararat which is in turkey and they opened the doors and all the animals went out <laughs> and it was precious to them. And so Noah and Nama and all of the people planted a vineyard. They planted grapes. And they, after they had those grapes, they stepped on them for a while. <laughs> and then it fermented, and they took a cup in hand, and they started drinking. And they drank, and they drank, and they drank, and they got pretty drunk. <laughs> and after they had gotten drunk, one of the sons laughed at his father, for he was exposed. And the other sons woke their father and told on him how short their memories were. And Noah woke up and cursed his son and said he should be a slave for all generations. And the women, they cried out, for they could feel the earth growing angry again, not able to suffer the violence. And one of the birds, the smallest of them all, flew up to the heavens saying, Oh, let me be a sacrifice for life. And her heart burst open into flames, and she became a rainbow in the sky. And the people saw her. And they remembered, and they embraced each other, and they heard a voice come down which said, God gave Noma the rainbow sign, no more water. It's the fire next time. The earth is the ark. Oh. Listen to the voices of the Jewish women. Listen to the voices of the Jewish women. 
Haudenosaunee. They lived here for thousands of years before we did. And you speak with their voices. They hear yours. <coughs> to the east, to the rising sun, to the new beginnings, to the beginnings here upon your land, seen by you, called for by you. a circle, as they do in the west, in a longhouse, as they did here in the east. To the Mother Earth, to the Father Son, voices that call, that live on this land, that knew that we were coming. There are many tribes who live in this country. The Hopis hold the greatest myths. And in their myths, they talk about a white goddess. They talk about how she will come in the age in which the land stands in great, great peril. It's difficult for me to stand here and speak of these things upon which you're walking. The Iroquois nation was a great nation. It was one of the first leagues of nation. They had something called a great law. And it was a belief in peace. It was an, an understanding of the value of heart and reason, both, and the necessity of peace. And there was a belief that those two things could make peace. Our dear men of the 1840s asked, what do women want? 
Is she seeking more than she now enjoys? <laughs> of what rights is she deprived? Words came quite clearly in response and distinctly in the Women's Convention in the year 1848, suffrage. Yet the suffrage movement was not new. It was conceived in the hearts and toil of women from the beginning of human consciousness. It was nurtured in the exhaustion and frustration of centuries of women laboring in their God-ordained role in society, showing signs of birth at isolated moments in history and definitely coming to birth here in this sacred space. Birth is one thing, but maturity is another. She wants to be acknowledged as a moral, responsible being. She is seeking not to be governed by laws in the making of which she has no voice. It's very moving for me to be here on this sacred soil, so sacred to all of you, so sacred to women all over the United States and our sisters in England who inspired this great meeting, this encampment here. And I just want to say that this whole program has moved me so much so far that it's very hard to go to my text, but I will. And first of all, on that bond that we have with the women of Greenham Common. When I first learned about that last December, on a very dark day in our own history, because so many of the days have been dark since the election of the present government. And so many days are so dark right now with war games 100 miles south of the state of Florida that I live in. But at that time, when the women of Greenham formed their nine-mile chain around the base in England, my heart lifted up, and I took new hope, and I decided then <coughs> that if anything was ever to be done in our country like that, that I would want to be here with you. And so I came up this week to be here. And also, I remembered another link in our history that when Aunt Susan was 85 years old and very near death, she was one year away from death, she made her last trip to Europe and to England. And it's no coincidence that she stopped in Manchester to visit Emmeline Pankhurst and the great Pankhurst women who were leading the women's suffrage movement in England at that time. And they later wrote that when they saw this great lady, this great woman, so fragile, near death, and realized that she would die without her dream of suffrage for which she had worked for women's rights for 55 years since she met Elizabeth right here in Seneca Falls. And when the Pankers saw this, they resolved that they were going to adopt the militant tactics of the English women's movement that led eventually to their suffrage. But more important for us American women, led to Alice Paul and Lucy Burns joining them in English jails in, while they were demonstrating and practicing civil disobedience for the right to vote. So we have that great bond with our, our country women, hands across the sea. But today, all of you here, and in the evening when I came last night and saw you all spread out in your 7 o'clock meeting, you look to me like the green shoots under the nuclear mushroom. <laughs> and this is a phrase that I've been using all year because I think of us as the green shoots of hope that are sprouting under that cloud, much like the haze that is over us right now, much like the helicopter, that ominous sound of the military that just came over and almost drowned out some of the beautiful music. But you are the green shoots of hope. And you are here because you are what I also call, as I am, and I thank God for it, you are descendants of descent. You are daughters of descent 
born of a nation of descent. And we can never forget that, that our nation was born of descent. And from the Iroquois women so beautifully portrayed to the Pilgrim Mothers of 1620, the Quaker martyr Mary Dyer, down through the American revolutionaries of the 18th century and the abolitionist heroines like Lucre Lucretia Mott, who was just so beautifully portrayed and who was just honored in the Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls. And right down to Aunt Susan and the founding mothers, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who launched the longest legislative battle in history for the right to vote. And that struggle for women's suffrage, lest we ever forget, is part of the struggle we continue today for the justice for all women, economic justice, social justice, and political justice. My family attended the first Women's Rights Convention, not at Seneca Falls, but two weeks later, in, on August 2nd, 1848, when the convention adjourned to Rochester, New York, the home of the Anthony family, and my great-grandfather, Daniel, his wife, Lucy, and his daughter, Mary, all signed the Declaration of the Rights of Women, so beautifully read to you just now. Susan wasn't here. A lot of people often think that Susan was at the Seneca Falls Convention, but she was off teaching school in Kanajahari, New York, and she didn't join. She was much more interested at that point in buying dresses. She had just gotten out of the Quaker gray, and she was spending her huge <laughs> salary of four dollars a week on her back. And she was like the nuns when they got out of habits. They all went close crazy. And so she wasn't there, but she made it two years, three years later, when she came to Seneca Falls and met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who with her, of course, were the lifelong friends and co-workers of the um, women's suffrage movement. She became interested in the movement because Frederick Douglass, the great black liberator, was at her father's dinner table, and Susan was doing the cooking and the waiting on table and listening to Frederick Douglass and to William Lloyd Garrison about the plight of the black man. And Susan was interested then in the black freedom for the black man, and then, of course, freedom for the black woman. My own grandfather, her youngest brother, who was little known, but he left the farm in Rochester to go off and fight with God's angry man, John Brown, in Osawatomie, Kansas. And one of, I am so proud of him, because though dying of a fever at the time, he, and John Brown spent the night before that, that guerrilla war, that guerrilla battle, in his cabin, warned him not to come because he was so sick, he crawled out and fought there, and of course to free, to keep Kansas free and not a slave state as they were trying to make it. Susan, meanwhile, went on, of course, not only to win the first real break in the common law that saw husband and wife as one, and that one the husband. That was the Married <laughs> Woman's Property Act. But Susan went on for the first act of civil disobedience in the women's movement in America. And that was, of course, in the election, presidential election of 1872 in Rochester, New York. And I visited her house the night before last. And I thought of her, and I relived the whole thing again as I'm reliving so much today. Susan took 15 housewives with her to the polls to vote. And for, and they were promptly arrested because they were breaking the law, of course, because women were not allowed to vote. And she was trying to test women's right to vote under the 14th Amendment. She was followed by a U.S. Marshal every time she took a train to do her, lecture, her nationwide lectures. And she always said, I must, I must protest you're leaving the jurisdiction of the court. And she said, goodbye, and got on the train and went off to lecture throughout the country on um, is it a crime for the US, a US citizen to vote? She made such a, a tremendous impression, not only in Monroe County, Seneca County, but all over, that they changed the venue of the trial to nearby Canadagua Courthouse. And so in 1873, right a few miles from here, Aunt Susan went on trial for the, tr for the crime of voting. And the judge who was in the pocket 
of one of the most anti-women bigots and black anti-black also, Roscoe Conkling of his day, directed the jury to bring in a verdict of guilty. And she was fined $100 for her crime. And he then made the mistake of asking if the prisoner had anything to say. <laughs> and, and of course, the rest is history. You've heard it on television, her magnificent speech in which she gave a review of all the wrongs done to women, not least of all that she had been arrested by men, she was being judged by men, she was being sentenced by men, and if she had gone to the gallows, she would have been hung by men. And so she said, Your Honor, I will never pay a cent of that unjust fine. But alas for her, her lawyer was not, had not had his consciousness raised, and so he said, I could never see a lady go to jail, which was exactly what she wanted to do, because she wanted to get the court, the case to the Supreme Court of the United States. So he paid her fine, and it remained for Virginia Minor to get the case to the US Supreme Court, and of course, women lost. And we had to wait then till Alice Paul and Lucy Burns returned from England ja English jails and put on the first picket line in the United States around the White House in 1917, and the rest is history. And the Anthony Amendment became law in 1919, and of course ratified in 1920.